Uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be here in God's house on this lovely Memorial weekend. I hope you're all having a blessed one. Um, this morning, Miss Ann gave me something that uh, she wanted to share with everybody. I'm going to try to read through it, and y'all you know, bear with me. It um, goes like this. I was a cook in the Navy and still just a kid, and my ship, the USS Bristol, was a great destroyer. But, but the hurricane we encountered off the coast of Bermuda was a violent storm. We were told that we could not outrun the gale but would instead have to ride it out. And what a ride we had. The ship would lift up out of the water and shake like a living thing. It would plunge back into the waves and roll to port side, then back, plunged and roll starboard, starboard. For days, we just gave the crew sandwiches and coffee. On the fourth day, though the sea was still rough, we thought we could fix spaghetti for dinner. So one sailor left his tray on the table while he fetched a glass of water. A large wave hit the ship and when he got back, his water, with his water, his tray was gone. What blankety blank so took my food, he hollered. The answer came up moments later. The hatch was open to the sleeping quarters below the mess hall and up came a sailor with a plate of spaghetti on his head. It was the first laugh we had in days and it was a big one. Patience, making the best of a tough situation. Keep trying until you succeed. Changing the things you can accept and those you can't. Oh, let's ask the Lord to breath our ties this morning. Holy Father, we thank you so much for this Memorial Weekend that we had to celebrate those men that gave their lives lord we we thank you so much for them and you you know putting it in their heart to save us and to go fight for us in battle we thank you so much we thank you for the the fathers and the military and, and women too lord we uh, want to uh, thank you for the blessings that you give us daily lord we thank you for our daily bread we, we want to lift up brother warber to you this morning and just use him to Bring us to the light and show us how to get to that beautiful city. Just just uh, lift our ties up to you, Lord. Uh, use them as a symbol of our obligation and our love, our love for you, Lord. We, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the battle he went through for us on that cross, Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Could my people call by my name? Humble themselves, pray. Seek my face. Turn from their broken ways. I will answer. Hear from heaven. I will forgive. I will heal their land. Heal the land. I will forgive. Let us sing. Let us pray. Pray, pray, pray. Coming back. Matthew chapter 2, Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. And let us pray. Father, speak to our hearts, to our needs, to where we are as individuals where we are as a church, where we are as a nation. May we hear you and hear all of you, including the parts we may not like. Holy Spirit, breathe. In this day and hour, breathe. In your name I pray. July 10th, 2016, I was in Washington, D.C. I stood before the Vietnam Memorial for the very first time. There are 58,318 names on that memorial. I'm a curious person by nature, and as I'm looking at all these names, I thought to myself, I wonder if there is a barge somewhere on this wall. They have a place right there at the memorial where you can go and pop in a name. I did so, and sure enough, I found a barge. 
tells you exactly where on those panels you can find the name. And I searched and found it, the name Frederick D. Barge. Frederick Douglas Barge. And I knew nothing about Frederick that day, except our common name, and he, and he was also named after another famous American. When I returned home, I did a little research. Private first class Frederick D. Barge was from Selma, Alabama, born on May 9th, 1946. He died in Vietnam on June 7th, 1969, less than a month after his 23rd birthday. He was awarded the Bronze Star and the Air Medal. He served in B Company, 2nd Battalion, 8th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division. During Memorial Day 2020, I thought of Frederick again. And again, I became curious and I made some other discoveries. Frederick began his tour of duty in Nam on May 23rd, 1969. 15 days later, he experienced a traumatic event which resulted in the loss of his life in the Tay Ninh province, South Vietnam. I remembered Frederick was from Selma and I thought, I wonder if I can find his grave. And so Memorial Day 2020, I hopped on my motorcycle. I had a little bit of knowledge. I knew that I was looking for the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church in Sardis, Alabama. And I drove there and found the church and I placed a flag on Frederick Douglass Barge's grave. Then I noticed the other tombstones there around him. And I took photos of the, every grave because I wanted to go back with names. I did. And I did a little genealogy research when I got back to the house and I made this discovery. Frederick Douglass Barge and I both had the same great, great, great grandfather, Lewis Barge. So I say thank you, Frederick for your service to our country. One of my favorite Westerns is Garden of Evil. There's a line in that movie that from very early in my life, it, it resonated with me. It's a line spoken by, by Gary Cooper, one of my favorite Western actors. There's a pivotal scene in the movie towards the end where a group of adventurers who have gone to rescue a man out of a gold mine deep into the heart of Mexico are returning to the coast to try to escape a band of marauding Apache Indians. There's a mountain pass there and one of the adventurers holds that pass to allow the others to escape. Once all the others are safe, Gary Cooper says, I'm going back to help that lone defender. The question is raised, why did he stay? Why did that man stay, that one individual stay at the risk of his own life to guard that pass? To which Cooper responds, somebody always stays. All over the world, somebody gets it done. Our world is so broken. That's such a call to stay to stand in the gap, to surrender and to sacrifice is in constant demand. And we can trace all the crises we are facing today in this hour back to the first three chapters of Genesis. You see, even Adam had no way of knowing that day in the Garden of Eden, they thought they were pulling an apple out of the tree. Not so much. They were actually pulling a pin out of a grenade. That pin was a sin, and the grenade was our world. And we've been living with the collateral damage from that ever since. And because of then, now, we were born on a battlefield. We're born on a battlefield. We are all children of war. 
Every soldier we remember this weekend was somebody's child. I now know at 23 years of age that Frederick Douglass Barge was the child of Roy and Freddie Barge, Roy Sr. We're born on a battlefield and the warfare we are caught up in is spiritual. And I think sometimes we forget this. I forget it. Our actions or lack thereof seem to indicate we forget. Last week I quoted Ed Erwin McManus's book, the barbarian way, and this week I do so again. In that book, McManus says, Paul reminded us, not only are we dropped into the middle of a war, but the war rages in the middle of us. You cannot run or hide from the war any more than you can run or hide from yourself. You can become a prisoner of war, but you are never exempt from the war. For some reason this week, I thought about a Christmas song. It's amazing. We are five months since Christmas. Can you believe it? I mean, it just seems like the other day, right? John Denver, my favorite pop singer, on one of his Christmas albums, recorded a little song called The Children of Bethlehem. And I thought about that song just randomly. And I thought, hmm, I don't, I'm not sure I know the lyrics to that song, and so I looked them up. And it's a sweet little carol of how the precious little children of Bethlehem one cold winter's night were awakened by singing in a heavenly light. And to make a short story, a short song shorter, they got up out of their beds, they went outside, they came to the manger where the sweet baby lay, and in doing so, the children of Bethlehem showed us the way. And we know the story, the Christmas story. We, we go over it every year for about four or five weeks. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, all of that. But if you go to the Gospel of Matthew, soon as the wise men pack up their camels and head back to where they came from, the Christmas story takes a violent twist. And there in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. The child is Jesus. Herod wants to kill him. Jesus is a threat to his throne. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Hmm. We're born on the battlefield. We're all children of war. And the warfare we are caught up in is spiritual. So if we really want to remember well this weekend, we need to expand our remembrance to include those, or beyond rather, those who wear our country's uniform. If I had flags up here this morning to represent every life that I have paused to remember in the preparation of this message. The first flag that I would place here would be an American flag, and it would be for Frederick Douglass Barge. I already talked about him. Then I would place a second American flag along beside it for Lieutenant Edward Tidrick, who died on June 6th, 1944. Able Company, 1st Battalion, Omaha Beach, Higgins Boat Number 2 out of seven boats. As they were going to the beach, Lieutenant Tidrick exclaimed, my God, we're, we're coming in at the right spot, but look at it. There's no shingle, there's no wall, there's no shell holes, there's no cover, there's nothing. Indicating there's no protection here where we're going into this beach. And at that particular moment when he said that, there was no firing either. But exactly 6.36 a.m., the Higgins ramps were dropped which was the signal for the Germans to open fire. Tidrick takes a bullet 
in the throat as he jumps from the ramp into the water. He staggers onto the sand and flops down. He has one more thing to say. He, he rises up on his hands, exposing himself to the Germans to give an order, and he is strafed by machine gun fire. Edward Tidrick died a child of war. I would place along beside those two American flags, a third American flag for Private Harrison Pierce, who on July 18th, 1863, was a member of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment, the first all-black regiment raised in the North. If you've ever seen the movie Glory, it tells about that reg regiment. He was killed in the Battle of Fort Wagner, South Carolina. He was born a free man, he died a free man, but he also died a children a child of war. Now it gets really interesting. Buckle up, I think. I would plant a Japanese flag beside the first three American flags for Maiko Nagasako. Maiko, on August the 6th, 1945, died with 140,000 others as an atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. Her eight-year-old sister, Emiko, survived the blast. Maiko died a child of war. I would plant a Polish flag for Hanak Kornfeld, who on July 7, 1942, at three and a half years of age, he and his entire family were marched into a gas chamber by Hitler's Nazi army, army at the Belsic Killing Center. Hennock died a child of war. I would plant five Ukrainian flags for the five children in Kramatorsk, who on April 8th this year, 2022, when the Russians attacked that train station, it was reported that that rocket that hit that station had written on the side for the children. Those five died, those Ukrainian children died as children of war. I would plant a victory flag for Gianna Jessen. Some might say Gianna was not even supposed to be here. She was born on April 6, 1977. Gianna's mother, seven and a half months pregnant, was advised to have an abortion. So Gianna's mother goes into the abortion clinic in the attempt, the abortion poisoning given to her to take care of her little body. Gianna's little body was abortioned by saline. For 18 hours, she burned in her mother's womb. But God overrode that abortion. And Gianna was born at an abortion clinic, two and a half pounds. Gianna was born a child of war. I wondered, because I'm curious, how many men and women have died in service to our country since we've been keeping records, since the Revolutionary War? 1.1 million soldiers have died since 1973. Roe versus Wade, 60, 62 million children have been aborted since that time. They die as children of war. I would plant 700 Christian flags for the anonymous victims of sexual abuse by Southern Baptist church leaders in the report that came out on Monday after two years of study among Southern Baptists report came out May 26. A list was released at that time of all the alleged church-related sexual abuse offenders. I looked at the list, went through the entire list. I looked at every name on the list of the offenders. And I found two ministers I know on the list. One I went to high school with, was friends with him in high school. The other was one of my best friends. One of my best friends. Best youth minister I ever knew. Barna. 
One of them is incarcerated today. The other committed suicide when he was told that he would be charged with molestation. I grieve for my friend's family. I grieve for every victim. For in that list of 700, there's 700 victims and they're anonymous. And a part of them died a little bit when that one that they trusted the one who said represented the name above all names because sin is in the world. That one they trusted killed a little something of their innocence in that moment. I would plant 22 Texas flags for the victims of Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. I love the drive between San Antonio and Fort Davis, Texas, where I lived for 17 years, took that drive often. You leave San Antonio, you come to the town of Hondo. I love town. The first time I ever drove through Hondo, Texas, there's a sign, city limit sign, and it says, this is God's country. Don't drive through it like hell. <laughs> Next town over, Uvalde. Beautiful town. Next town past that to the west of Uvalde, Brackettville, where John Wayne filmed The Alamo. We know what happened this week on Wednesday, May 24th. 19 children, two teachers were killed. And I just want to pause right now and read their names. Nevea Alyssa Bravo. Nevea, by the way, that's heaven spelled backwards. Jacqueline Casares. McKenna Lee Elrod. Jose Manuel Flores, Jr. Eliana Garcia. Irma Garcia, one of the school teachers. Uzziah Garcia. Mary Jo Garza. Xavier Lopez. J.C. Carmelo Luovanos. Tess Mata, Miranda Mathis, Eva Morellis, another one of the school teachers, Alithia Ramirez, Mate Rodriguez, Alexandria Lexi Rubio, Leia Salazar. Jaila Nicole Silguero, Elihana Cruz Torres, Rogelio Torres. When President Biden addressed the nation on Wednesday night, he expressed his grief and he was speaking from the loss did not know this about him or did not know all of this, but he was speaking from the loss of his first wife, a daughter, and one of his sons. President Biden closed with a statement that referenced Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. If that verse has ever meant anything to you because you were broken hearted or crushed in spirit, you identified with that moment. President Biden closed with these words. He said, may the Lord be near the broken hearted and save those crushed in spirit because they are going to need a lot of help. The names of the Sandy Hook victims, they're long forgotten, but I tell you who never forgot, their families. They're classmates. They still live with that every day. And so I would plant those 22 Texas flags for the 19 children, 19th fourth graders and two of their teachers who died as children of war. But the grace of God would have me mention one other name. And that's why there's 22 flags instead of 21. I would have a flag for the 18 year old shooter named 
Salvador, Lerondo, Ramos. I wondered if anybody ever told Salvador what his name meant. You know what Salvador means? Savior. Savior. I wonder if anyone ever told him about his Savior. And so Salvador, Salvador too, died as a child of war. We are born on a battlefield. We are all children of war. The warfare we are caught up in is spiritual. And that spiritual warfare often results in physical consequences. And when that happens, we must lament. <clears throat> After Herod did what he did, had all the babies, two years boys, two years old and younger, slain in Bethlehem. Verse 17 of Matthew 2 says, Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. We're born on the battlefield. There is always a Herod sitting on a throne somewhere that belongs to a rightful king. And sometimes that Herod's name is Putin. And sometimes that Herod's name is Adolf. And sometimes that Herod's name is Robert. Sometimes it's Donald or Joe or Barack or George or Jimbo or Fort. Rarely are we the only casualty as a result of our sin. 62 million abortions, that again has come up in the news because of the Potential coming reversal of Roe versus Wade. And God alone knows the circumstances of each one of those abortions. And I just want to reiterate, God has already paid, provided the way to pay the price for those sins. We don't know the circumstances that led to that. Because of our culture's acceptance of abortion, because of that this particular sin has been protected by our law so that we no longer consider it a sin, we consider it a right. No doubt many of the 62 million young mothers never even thought about taking a life. Never even entered their thinking. Why? Because our culture just says it's not taking a life. We've been deceived. All of us can be deceived. The Bible tells us who our deceiver is. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Yes, the deceiver does that to unbelievers, but I also know the deceiver does that to believers as well. We can want our own way so bad. Anybody gets in our way, including God, be damned. That's the insanity we fall under. One of my favorite podcasts, instrumental, J.J. Heller. And while there's been a hiatus of the Redemption Table podcast, we hopefully have one coming out Wednesday. But I would recommend Instrumental to you. One of the guests that she had was Jamie Ivey. And in that podcast I remember listening to months ago, it made an impact on me. Jamie, her guest, told of one of her guests on her own podcast who had become a believer. But before she became a believer, she had an abortion. And she said... Her guest said she remembered walking into the abortion clinic and there were men and women outside the front door. They were screaming and yelling at her, called her a baby killer. She went in, had the abortion. And then when she left the abortion clinic, she walked out the back door, for that's how she was led, out the back door. And she said there was nobody there. 
She said, where are the backdoor Christians? Where are the backdoor Christians caring for me after I went through that? There were none. They were only at the front door screaming. I just wonder how many who are crying out this morning for gun control because of what has happened in Uvalde are also crying out against the reversal of Roe versus Wade. We keep asking ourselves the question, how, how? We get so caught up in that rhetoric. I think it keeps us from touching the lives or remembering the survivors. We get caught up in that. Why? How does this happen? How is it that the United States leads the nations in school shootings at 228? Well, I believe part of an answer can be found in our confused stance on the sanctity of life. If it is a sin to kill fourth graders in the classroom, and it is, it is equally a sin to kill children in the womb. We can't play the game both ways. We can't play by two sets of rules. You try that in real life and everybody loses. And it seems especially the innocent. There's always a Herod sitting on the throne that belongs to a rightful king, and Jesus is a threat to their reign. That's what happened with Herod. Jesus was a threat to his reign. And if you want to know if that Herod on the throne is you or not, ask yourself the question, is Jesus a threat to your reign? I mean, perhaps you've already heard something in this message this morning that has created dissonance within you. Perhaps something that made you angry that I even put this along beside the other. Good question for us to ask ourselves is, if that's the case, why? Why? Is it connected to partisanship? Because you see the statements that were made labored over as this message was written, every single one of them are kingdom oriented. They're not political. In James 4, James said this, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. There are times like this week when all that rages around us seem impossible. It just, wow, <sighs> never ending. There are times when the accumulation of crises seem overwhelming. That's when we need to remind ourselves of one more truth, a simple truth. And some would say that's a simplistic truth. So simple, it seems naive. But man, is it true? It's powerfully true. It has become cliche. It might be the only Christian, Christianized bumper sticker I would place on my vehicle. Four words. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. He is the answer to school shootings. He is the answer to ministerial sexual misconduct and abuse. He is the answer to abortion. He is the answer to the spiritual warfare that rages today. He is the healing all nations need. I was out riding my motorcycle yesterday, passed by the Gilfield Baptist Church, Missionary Baptist Church in Wetumpka, and on their sign, they had something, I love it, fits right in. Jesus is the answer, here's what's on their sign. 
Jesus can fix it. Amen. That's pretty broad. It's true. Jesus can fix it. Our true belief in this or not, though, is revealed in how we live our lives. Either the sharing of this answer is a priority to you, or it's not. I can assure you this world is so broken that there is tremendous need for those of us who worship the name of Jesus Christ today. There's a tremendous need for us to stand in the gap, to surrender our lives and to sacrifice our lives, to stay so that it can be said of us, somebody always stays. All around the world, somebody gets it done. And spiritually speaking, God is calling on you and I to be that somebody. You never know what your witness for Jesus may have already accomplished or what may accomplish next. You may be the one God uses to help a young mother. Consider, reconsider a future abortion to change her mind about it because she meets Jesus. You may be the one God uses to help plant the seed that leads the next soldier who dies on a battlefield somewhere who will be remembered next year in Memorial Day. You may be the one God uses to turn around the next Salvador. That's how our eyes need to be opened. That's how we need to be seeking. That's what we need to be looking at. Not all the chaos. Yes, it's bad. Jesus is the answer. Rich Mullins' song that I sent this morning, Growing Young, I close with the words of this song. He said, I've grown so far from my home. I've seen the world and I have known so many secrets. I wish now I did not know because they have crept into my heart. They have left it cold and dark and bleeding, bleeding and falling apart. And everybody used to tell me big boys don't cry. Well, I've been around long enough to know that that was the lie that held back the tears in the eyes of a thousand prodigal sons. Well, we are children no more. We have sinned and grown old. And our father still waits and he watches down the road to see the crying boys come running back into his arms and to be growing young, growing young. Because I've been broken now, I've been saved, I've learned to cry and I've learned how to pray and I'm learning, I'm learning, even I can be changed. And everybody used to tell me, big boys don't cry. Well, I've been around enough, enough to know that that was a lie that held back the tears in the eyes of a thousand prodigal sons. We are children no more, we have sinned and grown old. But our father still waits and he watches down the road to see the crying boys and girls come running back into his arms and to be growing young. Let's pray. Father, help us. Change us. In your name I pray. Thanks, Lord.